Good morning, Walnut Village. Today we are in week 16 of our look at the Gospel of Mark, and today we are in chapter 12, verses 1 through 27, roughly half the chapter. Join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, the Holy Bible, that can encourage us, convict us, motivate us, and illuminate who you are in our minds and hearts. We ask that you'd open your word to us this morning as we study it together in your name, amen. So let's just uh, pick up where we left off last week in Mark 11. Just some of the highlights just to get you back up to speed as we enter into verse, into chapter 12 and get some context. Remember uh, that Jesus is Jewish. We sometimes forget that. But Jesus knew and followed the laws of Moses. And as Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, if all we had was the Gospel of Mark, we might think this was Jesus' first journey to Jerusalem. But the Gospel of John tells us of many previous trips. And Jesus, like any devout Jewish man, went to Jerusalem for as many of the major feasts and holy days as he possibly could. So he was no stranger to Jerusalem. And then we read about Palm Sunday that happens just before Easter. And Jesus had made careful arrangements with everything having a purpose. He followed the scriptures. He knew what was prophesied about the Messiah. So he deliberately chose a colt. And this is because in that day to come riding a colt, as opposed to a mighty war horse that the Romans might come in on, was to come as a man of peace. Jesus didn't want to come to Jerusalem and confuse everyone, pretending to be a conquering gen general. Rather, he was suffering servant, though triumphant. Now the crowds responded to this, and they responded to Jesus in a magnificent way. They spread out, quote unquote, the red carpet for Jesus. And it was made of palm branches, thus the name Palm Sunday, and their coats and cloaks as well. And if you think about it, unlike our giant closets of today stuffed with many suits and clothing articles, a person had usually one or maybe two sets of clothes that they wore. And so considering the expense and value of clothing in that day, this was really generous praise for Jesus that the people gave him. So Jesus came to Jerusalem and went into the temple. And we see again the courage of Jesus because he didn't hide from the authorities. In the Gospel of John chapter 11, it's clear that there was a price on Jesus' head and the authorities were actively looking for him. Now despite that threat, Jesus came into Jerusalem and he came in the most public way possible. He didn't come in through the dark of night and hide in the quiet places. He came right to the temple, the center of all Jewish activity. Now Jesus comes there and he looks carefully at everything. And this was no random act because we're told in the book of Malachi in the Old Testament prophetically that the Messiah coming to the temple would do a careful ass assessment of the temple uh, and look at his father's house. And then the curious chapter I mentioned last week, uh, Jesus curses the fig tree. Now this was not something you or I might do, which is uh, speak negatively about that car in front of us that cut us off. It's not that kind of a curse. And it seems so out of character and upsetting to think that Jesus would curse over such a minor thing, such as a fruitless tree. But this is a learning lesson for the disciples, a teaching moment. Jesus did miracles of feeding so he could have just as easily commanded the tree to overflow with figs and they could have eaten of them. But again, this was a time for Jesus to teach. And the tree was cursed for its pretense. Its pretense of leaves, which seemed to indicate that there would be an abundance of fruit, but there was a lack of fruit. And like Israel, in the days of Jesus, it had an outward form, but no fruit. In this picture, Jesus warned Israel, and us, by the way, of God's displeasure when we have the appearance of fruit, but not the fruit itself. God isn't pleased when his people, you and I, are all leaves and no fruit. This tree was cursed because it professed to have fruit, but did not. 
And this gave opportunity for Jesus to deepen the lesson that he was trying to teach them as they were going back and forth uh, to Jerusalem. Well, we pick up the story uh, in last week's chapter of Jesus and his righteous anger that we're all very familiar with. Jesus clears the thieves and the usurious money changers out of the temple. Now, God had always intended that this temple that he allowed to be built in his name and in his honor should be a house of prayer for all nations. But it had become a place where commerce and commerce by thieves uh, was carried out. And the thieves uh, hid in the temple, in a sense, and took advantage of the people, kind of like the proverbial wolf in sheep's clothing. But Jesus sees this, and he has righteous anger, and he has such disappointment. Well, Jesus then teaches about faith. And the phrase about removing mountains, which we read in the latter half of the chapter, was quite a common Jewish phrase. Uh, it was a regular vivid phrase for removing difficulties uh, from normal life. Mountain was a popular figure of speech for any insurmountable problem. And Jesus said that as we believe, God could overcome any obstacle. Now, that, I, I just want to clarify, that doesn't mean that Jesus couldn't pick up a mountain and throw it into the ocean. We know he could. He created the mountains. He created the ocean. But it's a figure of speech that he's using with the disciples to tell them anything is possible with God. And then finally, Jesus teaches that for prayers to be answered, first, we must be sure we are in right relationship with our fellow men. The forgiven heart will forgive others. If we have a hard, unforgiving heart, it's going to call into question if we ever received or appreciated the forgiveness of God ourselves, that which he's offered to us. And it will call into question whether we have any faith in Jesus at all. So we first must be sure that we are in a right relationship with each other and with God. Okay, that brings us to our passage for today, Mark 12. And we begin with Jesus telling the parable of the evil farmers. But I just want to start with a little background. Because Jesus spoke to a Jewish audience, they were aware that the vineyard was used in the Old Testament as a picture of Israel. And we see this in Isaiah 5, verses 1 through 7. Therefore, the vine dressers, uh, the evil wine dressers and farmers, they represent the rulers of Israel. And the vineyard represented the people of God as a whole. So with that backdrop, you might be understanding this parable a little better. Verse 12, of or verse 1 of chapter 12 then, excuse me. Then Jesus began teaching them with stories. A man, Jesus said, a man planted a vineyard. He built a wall around it, dug a pit for pressing out the grape juice, and built a lookout tower. Then he leased the vineyard to tenant farmers and moved to another country. Now let me stop here just for a minute and look at that curious phrase, a lookout tour, tower. Why would you need a tower? Well, in a vineyard, the tower was used for someone to keep watch. A watchman would look for uh, animals that might come, anything actually, that might come and destroy the vineyard. And it was common in those days, if you took issue with your neighbor, or if you had a real enemy, one of the first places they would attack, if you had a vineyard, was to come and burn your vineyard down, remove your livelihood, if you will. So a watchtower, a lookout tower, was always built, and a watchman would stand up there and, and look over the vineyard to be sure that nothing was coming to harm it. So at the time of the grape harvest, the owner of the vineyard sent one of his servants to collect his share of crops. But the farmers grabbed the servant, beat him up, and sent him back empty-handed. The owner then sent another servant, but they insulted him and beat him over the head. Are you getting angry yet? As a teenager, when I read this, my sense of justice was just overwhelmed. Well, verse 4, the owner then sent another servant, but they insulted him and beat him over the head. The next servant he sent was killed. Others he sent were either beaten or killed until there was only one left, his son whom he loved dearly. The owner finally sent his son thinking, surely they will respect my son. Well, we know that they didn't. We know this story. The vine dressers didn't buy the vineyard. They weren't entitled to it. They did not build it. 
They didn't build the watchtower or the wine press, nothing. They were just there to use it and use the land. And a generous owner allowed them to work in his vineyard, yet they turned against the owner. And one day they were going to have to answer for it. We're going to see that as we follow along in this story. So verse 7, But the tenant farmers said one to another, and here's where human greed gets in, Here comes the heir to the estate. Let's kill him and get the estate for ourselves. So they grabbed him and murdered him and threw his body out of the vineyard. Now, in this story, we see that the owner was more than patient. He sent messenger after messenger, even though they were all abused and mistreated. And in those days, to mistreat a servant that came uh, from his master was really to um, disregard the master, insult the master. Well, because the owner of the vineyard was not present at the time, he was in a far country, remember, the vine dressers doubted and mocked his authority. That, that he's not around. What can he do? Well, they soon found out that even though he, they couldn't see the owner, his authority was real. And this is part of the story that Jesus is trying to liken, the authority of God upon our lives. But verse 9, What do you suppose the owner of the vineyard will do? Jesus asked. I'll tell you. He will come and kill those farmers and lease the vineyard to others. Didn't you ever read this in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. That's what Jesus is wanting them to read in the scriptures and asks them, puts them on the spot. These religious leaders, they were cut to the heart and convicted by the Holy Spirit. They actually were. But they reacted to the conviction of the Holy Spirit in the wrong way. They reacted to being cut to the heart by rejecting Jesus, the Messiah, not by receiving him. And so they darkened and the plot grew worse as they began to plan to murder Jesus instead of repenting before him. Well, verse 11, this is the Lord's doing and it is wonderful to see. The religious leaders wanted to arrest Jesus because they realized he was telling the story against them. They were wicked farmers, but they were afraid of the crowd, so they left Jesus and they went away. Well, let's look at this a little bit. This parable tells us that Jesus knew he was the Son, the Son of God, and he knew with confidence that he would soon be killed. And the Son was then the final messenger, Jesus. There would be no other. And the message here is that Jesus is trying to drive home either these people, the religious leaders, all that would hear Jesus, would accept the message of the Son or face certain judgment. If you do not hear the well-beloved, and this is another of my wonderful Spurgeon quotes, if you do not hear the well-beloved Son of God, you have refused your last hope. He is God's ultimatum. Nothing remains when Christ is refused. No one else can be sent. Heaven itself contains no further messenger. If Christ be rejected, hope is rejected. I pause there to let the gravity of that sink in. Sometimes we miss this in the parable. We get so wrapped up in wanting justice, in not being able to believe how badly these vine dressers treated the master. And yet the message here is, that the Son is the last offer from God to reconcile himself with the world. And Spurgeon says it so well, if Christ be rejected, all hope is rejected. Well, the next section of the chapter and more of Jesus' teaching centers around taxes. Now, none of us like taxes, right? We know they're a necessary evil, but none of us like taxes. So this, this, this uh, centers on taxes paid to Caesar. Later, the, the leaders, the religious leaders, sent some Pharisees and supporters of Herod to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested. Let me stop here. Public opinion actually kept these religious leaders from just coming in and laying hold of Jesus. There was such popularity. I mean, he had just come off of Palm Sunday. So instead, they tried to turn the tide of public opinion against him. Public opinion kept them from being free to just kill him as they wanted. So they devised another 
strategy. Let's see if we can convince the people that Jesus is no good. So using a clever question, they wanted to make Jesus seem to agree with the Roman government against the Jews. Verse 14, teacher, they said, we know how honest you are. Oh, can you imagine the flattery? It's just dripping off their words. We know how honest you are. You are impartial and don't play favorites. You teach the way of God truthfully. Well, Jesus knew enough to not regard this flattery from his enemies. Sometimes our enemies flatter us because they want to hurt us. Sometimes our friends flatter us because they want to be kind and they think they're encouraging us. Either way, it is a mistake to put too much stock in what others say about us, either good or bad. Again, another Spurgeon quote. Uh, don't get tired of them. They're really good. <laughs> Spurgeon says to, to pastors in his day, it is always best not to know nor wish to know what is being said about you, either by friends or foes. Those who praise you are probably as much mistaken as those who abuse you. Okay, so verse 14, teacher, they said, we know how honest you are. You are impartial and don't play favorites. You teach the way of God truthfully. Now here comes the trap. Now tell us, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or shouldn't we? Here they come with this dishonest question, trying to show sincerity, but Jesus really knows. He, he can tell. And we read that. Jesus saw through their hypocrisy and said, Why are you trying to trap me? Show me a Roman coin and I'll give you an answer. So they handed it to him and he asked, Whose picture and title are stamped on it? Caesar's, they replied. They had no idea Jesus was leading them into a trap. Well then, Jesus said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Essentially, Jesus is saying here, you recognize Jesus, or excuse me, Caesar's civil authority when you use his coins and his services. Therefore, you are obliged to pay him the taxes he asks for. So here again, the message is, if we take advantage of the benefits of the governmental rule, we are obliged to submit to our government. And submit to our government just as long as it does not infringe on our service to God. And that's key to remember. Simply said, Jesus told us to pay our taxes. Now the Apostle Paul repeated this, and the same idea comes out of Romans 13, verses 6 through 7, where Paul says, Pay your taxes too, for these same reasons. For government workers need to be paid. They are serving God in what they do. Give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them and give respect and honor to those who are in authority. So Paul here is telling people to be civil, to be uh, rational, to be reasonable, and to do what is required so that they're a good example of, of Christians being a part of uh, a, a country and in support of the, the government of that country. Jesus asks the religious leaders, though, getting back to an explanation, Jesus asks the religious leaders to show him a con coin, which he uses as an illustration in making the point that we are citizens of both earth and heaven at the same time. And this is a quote from Morris, another theologian. We need to understand that given the promises of blessings and cursing under the old covenant, had the Jews rendered God his due, they would have never had to render Caesar anything. So that statement by Jesus, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's, if the Jews had just obeyed God in the first place and revered him and obeyed him as their God, they wouldn't have been under the judgment of God which was being perpetrated by the Roman rule and domination that they were under. The fact that they were under Roman domination was due to their own departure from the Lord. Well, we read in the scripture, Jesus' reply completely amazed them. Because in the answer of Jesus, God was glorified, Caesar was satisfied, the people were edified, and his critics were stupefied. You can remember those because they all rhyme, but that's, in a sense, the whole statement of what Jesus did 
in a very simple few sentences. Well, we move on then in the chapter to a discussion about resurrection. And we're going we're gonna to see the Pharisees and the Sadducees think they're so smart, but come up with some of the dumbest things you can imagine. So in verse 18, Then Jesus was approached by some Sadducees, a religious leaders who say there is no resurrection from the dead. Okay, let me just give a little explanation here. The Sadducees were a conservative, arist aristocratic, high priestly party. They were worldly minded and very ready to cooperate with the Romans, which of course enabled them to maintain their privileged position. So they were uh, corrupt, they were liberal in, in the sense of not taking all of the Old Testament, and they, they did what they needed to to retain their privilege and power. So they come along to Jesus and they pose this question. Again, they're trying to trap him. Teacher, Moses gave us a law that if a man dies, leaving a wife without children, his brother should marry the widow and have a child who will carry on the brother's name. We, well, suppose there were seven brothers. The oldest one married and then died without children. So the second brother married the widow, but he also died without children. Then the third brother married her. I wonder if she was getting sick of the family here. The third brother married her. Um, and, and then this brother, third brother, also died. And this continued with all seven of them, and still there were no children. Last of all, the woman also died. So here comes the stupid, absurd question. So tell us, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? For all seven were married to her. You can just see the Sadducees. They're, they're gleefully rubbing their hands together, thinking at last they have Jesus. But uh, just a little background here, too. The prevailing but prideful custom evidenced in this question by the Sadducees was that great value rested in a man's family heritage and name and with the inheritance, uh, which actually was temporal. Uh, and Jesus is offering those who believe in him to be heirs, but heirs of God for eternity. So for the Sadducees, what they put their value in was just earthly heritage and being heirs of a earthly treasure, whereas Jesus, uh, in, in the name of God, is offering us to be heirs of God himself for eternity. Okay, so back to that question in 23. So tell us, Jesus, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? For all seven were married to her. Well, the Sadducees, again, were well-educated, sophisticated. They were influential and wealthy. And they did not believe in the immortality or spirits or angels. The purpose of their question was to make the idea of resurrection seem absurd. Yet the hypothetical situation they present is in itself absurd. So you get the picture. They, they, they can't beat Jesus. So something that is of, of no value to them, which is the belief of eternity and life after death, they think, well, let's try to make that seem foolish if we can't make Jesus seem foolish. So Jesus replies again, your mistake is that you don't know scriptures and you don't know the power of God. Wow, pretty strong statement. Well, for us, when we don't know the scriptures, we don't have an anchor for the truth. And truth in today's life is absent most of the time. So we need an anchor for the truth and for our beliefs. When we don't know the power of God, we doubt God's ability to actually do what he has promised in the scriptures. So our anchor is first knowing the scriptures, knowing those promises that come from God, knowing who God is, and then uh, actually believing in the power of God to do what he promises, do what he says and to recognize that in him. And then verse 25, Jesus goes on, for when the dead rise, and here's the answer to the absurd question, uh, for when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. So Jesus showed that in the age to come, our lives will be lived on a completely different principle and in a dimension that we can't imagine in heaven. So, uh, 
Verse 25 again, For when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. But now, as to whether the dead will be raised, haven't you ever read about this in the writings of Moses in the story of the burning bush? Long after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died, God said to Moses, I am the God of Abraham. Notice he doesn't say, I was the God of Abraham. He says, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. So he is the God of the living, not the dead. You have made a serious error. So all this value that the Sadducees put in their earthly possessions and power, neglecting that eternity is for a very long time, and they could be heirs of God all through eternity, Jesus points that out to them by citing scripture. If Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did not continue to live, God would not say he is their God, speaking in the present tense. He would have said that he was their God. Therefore, using the very scripture that the Sadducees knew and studied proved there is a resurrection of the dead. Now, I also remind you that earlier in our study of Mark in chapter 9, remember that Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration so that even though the Sadducees questioned and doubted the belief in life after death, Peter, James, and John had experienced a sense of life after death with the appearance of Moses and Elijah. And so Jesus, again, strengthens those that believe him, gives them what they need to encourage them in their faith in him. And that's what he did uh, by allowing Peter, James, and John at that transfiguration. But we end the, chat, we end the first half of the chapter with Jesus uh, successfully, as he always does, parrying uh, the questions away uh, that uh, the religious leaders try to use to trap him. So just as we wrap up, uh, a couple things for you to consider. We go back to the illustration of the coin. The coin that was produced that Jesus had them look at belonged to, to uh, Caesar because his image was stamped on it. Now we should give ourselves to God because hopefully his image is stamped on on us. That's just something to think about. Read that over and think about whose image is stamped on you. Who do you belong to? And then this one about heaven. Many people make the same mistake as the Sadducees when it comes to their ideas about heaven. They think of heaven as just a glorious version of earth. Now earth, when it's in its perfection, the Garden of Eden, it is glorious. It is amazing. But heaven is something of a different realm so that people make that mistake well it's just going to be earth on steroids or it's just going to be better it's different it's wonderful it will have some of the characteristics because we read about a new heaven and a new earth but just think about it. the native american thought of heaven as the happy hunting ground we hear that right and the ancient viking thought of heaven as valhalla where they fought as warriors all day and at the end of the day all the dead and wounded rose whole again, celebrating and drinking in an all-night banquet. I'm not sure about those two understandings of heaven. But all these ideas mistake heaven for simply a better earth. And heaven's life is better, much more. It is of a different order altogether. That's what we need to remember about heaven. And why is it going to be of such wonderful, value and benefit and beauty and glory because Jesus himself will be meeting us there. We will have that opportunity to see God face to face. Okay, for our prayer, I ask you, I urge you to continue to pray for all the needs of our world, all the needs of Walnut Village as you have been doing so diligently. But I want you to think about this as you pray as well. The religious leaders surrounded Jesus plotted to kill him. And they were instrumental in his actually going to the cross. But he still cared for them, loved them, wanted to be their savior in spite of it. So as part of your prayer life this week, see if you can identify people whom you dislike or whom with you disagree or whom maybe you have even written off and ask God how you may pray for them and then do it. Okay, until next week.